All right, let's let's go to our Sunday school lesson. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, again. Hebrews 2. We've been reading about Christ's humiliation, his humbling, coming into the world as a man, as one of us. And let's continue uh, at Hebrews 2, verse 14. I'm going to read verses 14 through 18. However, today we're probably not going to get beyond verse 15. We'll look at two verses and we'll come back to this next Sunday. Uh, Hebrews 2, and let's read verses 14 through 18. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. <clears throat> now we come to the great verses um, in Hebrews that deal with the humanity of Christ, the humanity of him, that God came into the world as a mortal man. He was born of earthly parents, born to earthly parents, and uh, lived as a man, was subject to the weaknesses of the flesh like all men, and uh, therefore he can identify with the life of men. If God were to simply sit in heaven and tell people, I understand, I understand, when they pray to him, if he's never gone through anything, how can he understand? And therefore, by Jesus Christ, God can say, I know what it is to be hungry, I know what it is to be cold, I know what it is to be spat upon. I know what it is to be cursed and mocked by the religious high priest. I know what it is to be forsaken and abandoned by your own family members and your, your closest friends. I know what all of those things are like. I know what it is to be stripped naked and whipped and scourged and then hung up to public shame and ridicule on a cross. I know what it is to go through all of those things. Christ said, uh, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Christ didn't own a home. He didn't have a place to dwell in. He was at the mercy and the compassion of other people if they uh, took him in, or he slept outdoors with his disciples as they wandered the countryside listening to him teach and preach. But uh, so Christ understands so many things about earthly life and mortal life. But let's read a few uh, other related texts. Look at chapter 2. And look back at verses 1 through 4. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Look also at chapter 5, and uh, verses uh, 7, 8, and 9. Chapter 5, verses 7, 8, and 9. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. We mentioned, I think, last week, or maybe the week before, that uh, Christ was sinless, but he wasn't perfect. And what, what we mean by that is uh, he had never sinned, but he needed to have that sinlessness tested 
So he endured suffering. He endured temptation. The Bible says we uh, we have a, not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. There in Hebrews 4, verse 15. But uh, his, his perfection was... Uh, tested, it was proved, it was demonstrated and that he faced temptation, he faced the trials of life and yet came through them victoriously, never sinning, never succumbing to the guilt or the, or the, the uh, weaknesses of the flesh um, and therefore he did what men and women cannot do. He succeeded where you and I would all fail. And lastly, also look at Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, and let's read verses 10 through 14. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The Lord Jesus suffered uh, outside the city of Jerusalem at Mount Calvary, uh, much as they would take the, the, the worst parts, the animal, the hide, and the, the carcass, and the dung, and everything else that was unclean, and they would take it out and bury it outside the camp. And then they sacrificed an animal. And... Um, Therefore, Jesus Christ likened himself to the weakness, to the, uh, the humility of mortal men in his life and in his death. And then back to our text, verse 14 uh, today. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, I want you to notice how the word partakers is used, and remember it when we get to chapter 6, verse 4. Partakers of flesh and and blood, and we are, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, as by means of death, Christ died for us, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So it's the devil who has the power of death, although it's the Lord himself who decides whom the devil can take and whom he cannot. God said back in Deuteronomy 32, Verse 39, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. But the one who takes the lives of men is the devil. Satan is said right here to have the power of death. The Lord kills in that he gives Satan permission to act. Go, if you will, back to the book of Job. Right before the book of Psalms, Job chapter 1. Job 1. And uh, notice verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath, meaning Job, is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And chapter 2, verse uh, 6. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan has power to kill, as God gives permission. And... Uh, the Bible, Christ said, this, the, um, the devil, the enemy, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. John chapter 8. Uh, verse 15 in our text. It says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The idea is that before Christ showed up, even those people living under the Old Testament law and commandments who were among the righteous in the Old Testament sins. By the way, let me pause right there. 
um, everybody seems to have this instinctive idea that if you're good enough, if you're out, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll go to heaven. But if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you'll go to hell. And I have this idea that I've got to do as much good as I can to earn my way into heaven, which is a dumb idea, and I'll tell you why. Uh, let's suppose you're 30 years old, you're 35 years old, and all your life you've basically just lived for yourself. You really weren't interested in, you know, doing any charitable work or giving your money away to some worthy cause. You, you just got by and got as much as you could and make as much money as you can on your job or get every promotion you can get or get as much education as you could get, thinking that will open up doors for you. And uh, you're basically, I mean, that doesn't mean you're an evil guy. You weren't out robbing banks and so forth. But you lived your life for yourself. And something happens to you, some measure of conviction comes upon you that maybe there's more to life than just me. You join a church, and that church tells you that your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds, or you're not going to make it. So you start doing good for other people. But what you've forgotten is that you're already 35 years behind. You've got at least 35 years to make up for before you can even start breaking even. And no one can do it. Nobody's life is that pure and perfect and sinless and spotless 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. You're going to make it. And so the idea that my good deeds must outweigh my bad deeds and I'll go to heaven is uh, wrong with all kinds of problems. But uh, the idea is that before Christ showed up, even people who were living under the Old Testament law, they were considered righteous because at the time they're good. they were known for doing more good than bad. And therefore, God called them the righteous. God called them the faithful. God called them the saints. But if someone's bad deeds were more prominent than their good deeds, they were known for doing bad all the time, living selfish. They were called fools. They were called the wicked. They were called the unjust. They were called the ungodly. God all, God, Lord had all sorts of names for them. And in that sense, good versus bad, that was to some large degree true in the Old Testament system of things. The problem is the world today thinks it's still the same way. They want to skip over what Christ's life, his death and resurrection mean, uh, and say it has no effect on how things are. It's still the same uh, plan of salvation. Your good has to outweigh your bad. That's not true. <clears> then <throat> they were afraid, uh, those people who were considered righteous were in bondage to fear. They were afraid of dying. Satan knew that, he said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. There in Job 2, verse 4. Because they didn't know for sure whether God would accept them when they died. They had no absolute certainty that they had done more good than bad. And they had done good all the way up until the time of their death. Go back, or rather go, yeah, go back, the Old Testament to Ezekiel, Chapter 18, Ezekiel 18, <clears throat> and uh, let's begin there with verses 5 through 9. <clears throat> it says there, beginning at verse 5. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and have not eaten upon the mountains, neither have lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither have defiled his neighbor's wife, neither have come near to a minstress woman, and have not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, he that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, 
hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, and there you take a big breath, he is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Jump forward to verses 21 and 22. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So God says your good deeds have to be absolute. He lists, he, he lists a number of things that the righteous man was expected to do. Not give money to usury and charging uh, unfair uh, interest on money you've loaned out, uh, have not fornicated with someone else's wife, have kept himself clean uh, from a menstruous woman, and all those other things, have not looked up upon the idols of Israel and worship any images and statues. And all of those things he lists there in the first verses we read. Uh, he was expected to do those things. But, according to verses 21 to 22, he was expected to do those things all the way up until the time of his death. As he talks about an unrighteous man, a wicked man, who decides to turn to God late in life, right before he dies. And if he did so, he would die as a righteous man, and all of his wickedness before would be forgotten. And yet, contrary-wise, if a righteous man turns from God and commits wickedness before he dies, he would die as a wicked man, and all of his goodness would have been forgotten. It's a very demanding, a very exacting uh, way to live um, under that system. And even in an extraordinary case um, like King David, where the Bible calls, says the sure mercies were promised to him in Acts chapter 13, when he sinned, uh, he was scared that he might lose the Holy Spirit after he committed adultery with um, Bathsheba, uh, not Bathsheba, um, Hmm? Yeah, that's right. No, yeah. I'm thinking of Bathsheba, I'm thinking I got her confused, somebody else. Uh, he said in Psalm 51, verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So the presence of the Holy Spirit would lead and direct a man, it would impart wisdom to a man as long as he was faithful to God, See, as long as he kept all of those things, like Ezekiel enumerated and listed, and he did all those things. Uh, the Holy Spirit would be his lead, his guide, his director in life uh, before God. But the Holy Spirit was not a permanent possession inside the body of the man. And so, based upon someone's sin, the Holy Spirit could leave and not lead and direct that man. And that was what David feared. He prayed that it wouldn't happen. But now, thank the Lord, after Calvary, we have a situation where the one in charge of the executions has been whipped and tortured and put to shame on behalf of the sinner. Okay. Look at verses 8 and 9 back in our text again. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's read verses 8 and 9 again. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he hath, excuse me, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The Lord Jesus Christ died as a substitute, as payment, as a ransom for the sins of and the souls of every man who would ever come into the world. He tasted death for every man. 
And uh, the question comes up, what about people who died uh, before Jesus ever came? They died, they were among the wicked um, and found in hell. What about them? Well, the Bible says that uh, Romans 2, verses 14, 15, 16, long are there, that when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. A man will be judged by his conscience. If he was born before uh, Christ came along, he knew certain things were right and wrong. He knew that it was wrong to steal what didn't belong to him. He knew that it would be wrong to murder someone innocent who was innocent. He knew that it would be wrong to uh, commit adultery with uh, another person's spouse, another person's wife or husband. And, um, and yet, knowing those things, knowing just by instinct that certain things were wrong, he went ahead and did them anyway, thinking he could get away with it. As long as no one saw him, he figured he'd get away with it. And so based on his conscience, God will be justified in judging him uh, for having violated what he knew to be right and wrong. And God will be vindicated, he'll be justified, and the, the, the man or the woman will stand uh, guilty before God. After the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, someone who's never heard the gospel, someone who's never been visited,